This is Barry Zelma speaking for Claim School Incorporated's blog, Zelma on Insurance. Today we're going to speak about why in Connecticut a plaintiff must prove that the insurer acted as a general business practice to get bad faith damages and the fact that accepting a claim but arguing about the amount of the claim is not bad faith. In Paul Harrigan v. Fidelity National Title Insurance Company, a September 6, 2022 decision of the Court of Appeals of Connecticut, Paul Harrigan appealed from the judgment of the trial court following a bench trial that rendered in part in favor of the defendant Fidelity National T Title Insurance Company in connection with the title insurance policy issued by the defendant to the plaintiff. Harrigan challenged the judgment in favor of the defendant only with respect to count two of the operative complaint, the third revised complaint, which alleged that the defendant's conduct in handling an insurance claim filed by the plaintiff pursuant to a title policy violated the Connecticut Unfair Insurance Practices Act, QIPA, General Statutes 38A-815 at SEC, and that such unfair and deceptive acts or practices of the defendant thereby violated the Connecticut Unfair Trade Practices Act, CUPA, General Statutes 42-110A at SEC. Harrigan claimed on appeal that, one, the court applied an incorrect standard in its analysis of whether the defendant violated QIPA by requiring a finding of common law bad faith by the defendant for the plaintiff to establish a violation of QIPA. Two, whether the proper standard is applied, the record sufficiently demonstrated that the defendant violated the relevant provisions of QIPA. And three, the evidence submitted by Harrigan established that the defendant's unfair practices were part of a general business practice as required by the statute. The court found that sometime in the late fall, Harrigan conclusively learned that he did not, in fact, hold title to the disputed area. By letter to the defendant, Harrigan made a claim upon his title insurance policy regarding the disputed area. By letter to Harrigan, the defendant acknowledged receipt of his claim, and the defendant essentially accepted his claim. The issue between the parties always involved the claim's value. In a third revised complaint, the plaintiff alleged four counts against the defendant. The second count, which is alleges a violation of Kutpa, is the only count at issue in this appeal. In count two, the Harrigan alleged that the defendant was involved in the trade or commerce of providing title insurance to individuals and entities who hold title to real property, the defendant engages in unfair and deceptive acts or practices in an administration of the title policy and handling of the plaintiff's claim in violation of QIPA. The matter was tried to the court, which rendered judgment in part in favor of the defendant with respect to counts 2, 3, and 4 of the third revised complaint. In its analysis, the court found that to sustain a quipa cause of action, kutpa, a plaintiff must allege conduct that is proscribed by quipa. A plaintiff cannot bring a kutpa claim alleging an unfair insurance practice unless the practice violates quipa. If the factual basis of the trial court's decision is challenged, the clearly erroneous standard of review applies. A court's determination is clearly erroneous only in cases in which the record contains no evidence to support it or in cases in which there is evidence but the reviewing court is left 
with the definite and firm conviction that a mistake has been made. The legal conclusions of the trial court will stand, however, only if they are legally and logically correct and are consistent with the facts of the case. There was no evidence the Court of Appeal found presented that could have supported a finding that the defendant violated the statute. Indeed, the trial court specifically found that the primary issue at the case was the value of the plaintiff's claim, not its legitimacy, that at no time did the defendant indicate any unwillingness to pay the claim and that the defendant never denied the claim, and in fact essentially accepted the plaintiff's claim not long after receiving his demand letter. The evidence presented by Harrigan, which showed that the parties disagreed about various matters, such as the date of loss, the re relocation of the septic system, and the value of the plaintiff's claim, simply does not demonstrate any misrepresentations by the defendant, nor did the court find any. In fact, the court specifically found that at no time during the claim settlement process did the defendant's personnel act in bad faith or come within close proximity of doing so. Moreover, the evidence presented showed numerous communications between the plaintiff and representatives of the defendant concerning the state of the plaintiff's claim and why its resolution had been delayed for more than five years, which could support a finding of violations of parts of the statutes, both of which relate to delays in communications and settling the claim. During the trial, the plaintiff sought to admit into evidence Exhibit 44, which consisted of the consumer complaints of other consumers. We need not set forth, the court said, general principles governing the resolution of this issue. The Supreme Court of Connecticut has concluded that claims of unfair settlement practices under COIPA require a showing of more than a single act of insurance misconduct. Citing a case called Mead v. Burns, a 1986 decision of the Supreme Court of Connecticut. In the present case, the court specifically found that the defendant's actions in this case clearly did not represent shining examples of sterling claims management practices and that the issues that arose in the delay that resulted in this case were due in no small part to Harrigan's unrealistic expectations colliding with the defendant's maddening corporate inefficiency. Furthermore, in the present case, a great deal of the delay was attributable to the issues raised by the plaintiff concerning the septic system, which the court found not to be relevant to the diminution in value figure. The delays in the present case, therefore, were caused by both the plaintiff and the defendant and resulted in part from corporate inefficiencies and mismanagement of the defendant. The evidence of the present case, however, does not support a finding that the defendant ignored communications from the plaintiff. The plaintiff, having failed to establish a general business practice of the defendant, has failed to set forth a valid CUIPA CUIPA claim, which is fatal to the CUTPA CUTPA claim in count two. The court therefore properly rendered judgment in favor of the defendant with respect to the CUTPA claim in count two. In my opinion, delay in resolving a claim due to actions of the insured and the insurer, whether less than competent claims handling, is not evidence of bad faith or violation of the state statutes requiring it to treat the insured fairly and in good faith. The trial court and the appellate court decided there was no evidence of a general business practice to act in bad faith, 
and therefore the claim of Harrigan that the insurer acted in bad faith failed after the court re rendered a lengthy and detailed opinion putting aside all of Harrigan's claims. This video was adapted from my blog, Zelma on Insurance, which is available free to anyone who goes to zelma.com slash blog. And they should also subscribe so they would not miss a single blog posting or video. If you found this video to be useful or interesting to you, please tell your colleagues and friends about it so that they can also subscribe. And please also consider subscribing to my Locals community and my publications at substack.com. Thank you for your attention.